will this seated clerk unveil mysterious Egyptian secrets? What kind of history and wisdom are hidden behind this renowned museum? Perhaps, from the messages left by the two famous ancient civilizations, we can start to explore their stories about life and death, power and wisdom, the cosmos and eternity. This is a statue made of limestone. His name is unknown. What is known is that he came from ancient Egypt 4,500 years ago. In the Louvre Museum, people usually call him the seated clerk. He will lead us into mysterious ancient Egypt. What kind of a world will he reveal? Egypt is a kingdom of pyramids. The Nile crosses the entire country. Ancient Egyptians believed that, like the sun, dead people could rise from the grave and life would go round in circles. What were their lives like? What kind of art did they create? And what did they dream of? What's more, what are the differences between the ancient Chinese and the ancient Egyptians? In the Louvre Museum and the Forbidden City, we will start to explore stories of life, death and eternity. I was a clerk. My responsibility was to write and record the history of Egypt. In 1853, I left my hometown and was taken to Paris by Frenchmen. People said that it was two famous Frenchmen who brought me to Paris. Here in the museum, people are very fond of me. They come to see me and always talk about me. I don't know why I'm so popular. European civilization originated in ancient Greece. But in the 16th century, many Europeans began to speculate that ancient Greek civilization originated from ancient Egypt. Inspired by the curiosity of their origin, they started to explore the mystery of ancient Egypt. But many difficulties had already been put in their path. In 1798, Napoleon started the long expedition to Egypt, attempting to conquer the country, but he failed. Three years later, over 150 scholars who accompanied Napoleon's troops took chests of notebooks and looted goods back to France. This marked the beginning of Egyptian studies and led to renewed interest in ancient Egypt. However, the centuries-old civilization had been buried by history for so long that no one could understand it. In 1822, a man called Champollion deciphered Egyptian hieroglyphs after months of field studies. This is the Valley of the Kings, where more than 60 Egyptian pharaohs were buried. 
In 1822, Champollion had been living among the tombs for three months. He gradually worked out that Egyptian characters were actually hieroglyphics made of special signs. This is part of a mural from a tomb. The goddess Hathor is shown, welcoming the pharaoh Seti I. The hieroglyphs above the pictures were comprised of three parts. Ideographs, phonograms and determiners. Armed with this knowledge, Champollion decoded the characters above the picture. From then on, people finally knew that the tomb belonged to Pharaoh Seti I. In addition, close to the pharaoh's name was the inscription, you will live forever like the god of the sun. Champollion took the mural to France. Now it's one of the highlights of the Louvre. His decoding method brought Champollion honor and social status. He was regarded as the father of Egyptology in Europe. From then on, the mysterious Egyptian civilization began to be rediscovered by people from all over the world. In 1826, following an order from Charles X, Champollion became the first supervisor of Egyptian relics at the Louvre Museum. At that time, almost 4,000 Egyptian relics collected by a British diplomat to Cairo had also been delivered to Paris. Champollion personally helped design and decorate the Louvre Museum's Egyptian Antiquities Department, the Hall of Gods, the Hall of Folk Relics, and two halls of grave relics were built one after another. Il y avait une rivalité entre les différents consuls qui constituaient des énormes collections égyptiennes. Et c'est par ces collections d'ailleurs que euh, le monde de l'Égypte pharaonique a été connu en Europe, beaucoup plus que par l'expédition de Bonaparte elle-même. Elizabeth Delange is the current curator of the Department of Egyptian Antiquities. She knows a thing or two about this nameless clerk. De plus, il a les yeux incrustés dans une petite larme de cuivre avec du cristal de roche qui est creusé à son extrémité et ce creux capte la lumière et donne l'impression d'une pupille qui se dirige différemment en fonction de la place où vous vous trouvez de, devant lui. Donc ce n'est pas un scribe écrivant, mais c'est un scribe écoutant. Et c'est assez rare. Yes, I'm listening. We class were among the few people in the kingdom who could read and write. This power was given by the almighty gods, so we were regarded highly by both the pharaohs and ordinary people. People listened to the orders from the pharaoh and wrote them down on obelisks, in huge temples or on tomb walls. More often they were written on a kind of paper made of papyrus. This is a Wu Hung, 
who has worked in both the Palace Museum and at Harvard University, specializes in art history and anthropology. He has a unique understanding of ancient China and ancient Egypt. At that time, the pharaoh was the core of the kingdom. Blessed by the gods, he enjoyed supreme honor and power. We believe that people lived forever. When the pharaohs were alive, they always built grand temples and tombs. After they died, their bodies would be mummified and spells were cast to keep the bodies immortal for the afterlife. At the entrance of the Egyptian Antiquities Department is a granite sphinx statue. It has a lion's body and the face of a pharaoh. In ancient Egypt, lions symbolized supreme power. So ancient Egyptians combined pharaoh's faces with lion's bodies to give the pharaohs power and dignity when guarding temples and pyramids. Pyramids symbolize the pharaoh's power, and his afterlife also started from here. Through the pyramids towering into the clouds, the pharaoh's soul would rise to heaven. The most mysterious element in the Egyptian department was the falcon that covers the murals, statues, tombs and temples. The falcons were everywhere because every pharaoh was an incarnation of the sun god Horus. And Horus always took the shape of a falcon. As a result, the falcon became the most dignified animal of ancient Egypt. The concept of divine right of kings existed not only in ancient Egypt, but also in ancient China. In the authoritative Chou rituals, Chinese emperors were also considered as sons of heaven. Emperors ruled the entire nation based on heaven's will. The Forbidden City was so called because it was regarded as the residence of the celestial emperor by the ancient Chinese. In China, the dragon was both the totem of the Chinese nation and the symbol of emperors. Even now, the Chinese still identify themselves as descendants of the dragon. Bronze cauldrons symbolized the Chinese emperor's power in ancient times. Legend has it that one of the rulers once built nine golden cauldrons under a mountain to represent all of the states under his rule. From their origins as ritual vessels used during sacrifices, cauldrons gradually took on more important meanings. At that time, people referred to establishing a dynasty or a capital as establishing a cauldron. Chinese古人, 
常常是巨大的墓葬，都是强调一种啊、呃、等级和权力。所以创造这些艺术的过程呢，实际上也就是一种保持这个权力、增强这个权力的一个过程。所以艺术有非常强的政治性和社会性。Every July, we were full of anxiety and uneasiness because the Nile flooded at this time every year. But we also looked forward to that because we hoped that the Nile's flood would turn the desert into fertile farmland. We recorded them on papyrus. In this picture, other characters were used. The wavy line represented the Nile, and the red dot was the sun. This meant eternity. In this way, we hoped that the Nile would behave like this forever. With a history of around 3,500 years, this mural came from the tomb of Unsa. Perhaps the owner of the tomb had intended to draw his afterlife, but perhaps he had never imagined that the mural would tell us about the lives of Egyptians who lived around the Nile at that time. The annual flood had just subsided, and land had reappeared from the water. In the picture, men are working hard on the land, plowing, sowing, and harvesting. Women pick ears of corn as they follow the men or bring them food and water. The seated woman, wearing a panther skin dress, sits on a stool with bull's feet. Offerings for her afterlife include a leg of beef, plenty of bread, and beer, as well as cosmetics. This was only a fragment of life around the Nile, which might have been repeated year by year throughout the history of Egypt. Occasionally, a worker caught a fragment and recorded it, making it timeless. Like the Nile. The Yellow River has also given birth to an ancient civilization, but it isn't as generous or as regular as the Nile. The Yellow River is quite aggressive and fierce, and its water is mixed with huge quantities of silt. In the past, people had to build higher and higher banks on the river, but could still not control the floods. The Yellow River's frequent floods had swallowed many people's lives and lands. The ancient Egyptians worshipped and adored the Nile. Unlike the Egyptians, the ancient Chinese had fought the Yellow River for thousands of years in their attempts to prevent flooding. In spite of that, this uncontrollable river did create Chinese civilization. An excellent emperor in ancient China devoted his whole life to controlling the Yellow River. Over 200 years ago, Emperor Qianlong of the Qing Dynasty had the story carved on a huge piece of jade. Ancient emperors all attached importance to controlling the Yellow River. From royal artifacts to folk items, people retold the story of the Yu. In various ways, the story purified the nation's soul and cultivated Chinese people's toughness and perseverance. Of our kingdom happened in 3,100 BC. 
Before that, the whole of Egypt was divided into Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. People in Upper Egypt liked the color white. Their kings wore white crowns and worshipped vultures. People in Lower Egypt liked the color red. Their kings wore red crowns and worshipped cobras. Later on, Upper Egypt conquered Lower Egypt and Egypt became a united empire. A cobra is engraved at the center of a rectangular sign which represents the palace and symbolizes the king. The falcon atop represents the gods. Such a combination embodied the king's dignity and power. This steel of the serpent king was a symbol of ancient Egypt's unification. A united kingdom, a steady political system, the regular rise and fall of the Nile and fertile lands brought people a stable and rich life. This unchanging way of life even extended into the realm of art, establishing Egypt's unique art style. In ancient Egypt, people with special skills were required to finish a painting or a statue following divine rules and regulations, which they were not allowed to break. Most Egyptian pharaohs preferred to be worshipped and remembered in divine positions. As a result, in Egyptian artifacts, men's bodies were larger than women's, and their skin was darker. The feet of men of high social status had to be apart, one foot forward and the other to the rear. If they were seated, their hands would be on their knees. Their bodies faced directly forward, but their hands and feet were shown in profile. But this stable mode had at one time been broken. During the 18th dynasty, a maverick ruler changed the whole of Egypt if only for a short time. He was Pharaoh Akhenaten. In contrast to those handsome and dignified Pharaoh statues, Akhenaten's statue truly depicted his real appearance. Because of his uniqueness, he became one of the most famous Pharaohs in history. The Louvre Museum is rich in relic collections from the period of Pharaoh Akhenaten. It's interesting that the artistic works of that time did away with previous conventions. But, like a falling star, this style only lasted a short time. After Akhenaten passed away, his reformations were soon abandoned, and Egypt resumed its original course. To us, as the sun rose and fell every day, and the Nile dried and flooded every year, life and death went around in a circle. So the Nile was the boundary of life and death. We built cities on its eastern side, and built temples and tombs on its western side. In this way, the souls of dead people could take the boat of the sun god in the east 
cross over the sky, the land and the Nile, and then go to the tombs. We believed that, according to God's arrangement, the souls would return to the bodies one day. Why did the Egyptians believe that people would be reincarnated after death? In the Egyptian language, boat means traveling. In the Louvre Museum, there's a group of boat relics. In the middle of the boat is a mat shelter under which lies the pharaoh's body. Several slaves stand or crouch by his side. Perhaps they are escorting the pharaoh to the underworld. To the ancient Egyptians, people's lives started on one side of the Nile and ended on the other side. The mysterious eyes drawn on the bow are called the eyes of Horus, symbolizing regeneration and justice. Egyptians believed that death was not the end of everything, but the beginning of regeneration. To the dead, the eyes protected the body from evil spirits, like an amulet. The Egyptians took good care of their deceased bodies while waiting for regeneration, and also packed their favorite goods. Like a person going on a long journey, they got everything ready and started the journey happily and peacefully. When the journey ended, they would open the package and return to the corporeal world. That's why so many mummies were unearthed in Egyptian tombs including human and animal mummies. Puisqu'il y a une chose très importante à connaître dans le monde de l'égyptologie au niveau de la pensée, il était clair dans leur euh, euh, dans leur pensée que la momie ou le défunt, le support physique devait traverser l'éternité, que le corps continuait de vivre à travers pendant tout le temps de la mort. Chinese emperors also had a way to preserve their bodies within their tombs. The bodies were covered with pieces of jade, stitched up with golden threads. This jade outfit from the Han Dynasty has distinctive features for the nose, eyes and mouth, as well as two elaborately made hands. The body in it would decay and disappear, but the jade would never decay, so the jade would replace the body, symbolizing eternity. So from here, we can see that the Han people's opinion, the body's opinion, the death of the death, and the Aegean people have a similar connection. They also seek the death of the death, and seek the death of the death, but their methods are different from the death. Before Buddhism was introduced into China, the concept of six realms of reincarnation had not spread to the country. At that time, people thought the cosmos was made up of heaven, earth, and human beings. Heaven was yang, and the earth was yin. After death, the spiritual soul would separate from the body and rise to heaven, but the corporeal soul would disappear with the body into the earth. This cloth-like silk painting was found in a tomb of the Han Dynasty. Its content can be divided into three levels. On the top level was heaven. 
On the right was the sun. And on the left, a crescent moon. There are also some seated immortals and two flying dragons. In the middle is the world of mortals, where human beings lived. An old woman stands. Someone kneels in front of her, apparently saying something to her. The lowest level was the underworld. A strong man supported the land with his arms. Around him were many strange birds and beasts. It looked like a mythical, legendary world. The dragon boat riding painting and dragon and phoenix painting unearthed in Changsha also told the story of soul guiding. In the paintings, people wear wide gowns with large sleeves, as good looking and magnificent as the immortals. The woman has her palms together, as if expressing her thanks to the dragon and the phoenix. These paintings combined the real world and imagination together to express the Han people's beliefs. They felt reluctant to leave the mortal world and hoped to gain more happiness in heaven after death. In heaven lay freedom and romance. Chi The Egyptian collections in the Louvre Museum mainly came from the tombs of our kingdom. These items were prepared for the afterlife of the people in the tombs. We would also draw every detail of that life on the walls of our tombs. After we died, we would go through various tests to enter the afterlife. The book recording the rules and tests was called the Book of the Dead. Every tomb in Egypt had a copy of it. The book told the dead how to pay tribute to the gods how to pass the tests, and how to gain a new life. The content was written on papyrus and carved on walls, and may have been longer than the River Nile itself. According to the book, the most important test for the dead was the heart weighing test. The heart of the dead man and the feather of Lady Justice would be put on either side of a scale. If the heart was heavier than the feather, the dead man was guilty and would be swallowed up by the crocodile god Sobek. If the heart weighed the same as the feather, the dead man was not guilty and would start the journey of regeneration with the gods' blessings. This woman wears a close-fitting dress which reveals the curves of her body. She holds a jug with a basket of food on top of her head. 
The water and food were offerings for the dead in the tomb. These funerary objects have brought us insights into life along the Nile thousands of years ago. Maybe it's the Egyptians' special concept of life and death that made them so calm and optimistic. Perhaps this is also why Egyptian civilization is so enduring and captivating today. Both the bronze and jade vessels in the Palace Museum and the Egyptian artworks in the Louvre have brought us insight into the ancient people's understanding of life and death thousands of years ago. With vivid imagery, these artworks tell us the life stories of those ancient times. Our story has not finished yet, but our thoughts are drifting away. I want to stand at the foot of the Grand Pyramids. I want to look up at the solemn pharaoh statues. I want to listen to the sounds of the Nile in the sunshine. And I want to smell the dust in the air. It's not that we want to leave here. We have been away from home for so long that we're afraid we will forget what it looks like. If you find yourself in Egypt one day, Please visit our homeland on our behalf. In the Louvre Museum, we come close to the gods of ancient Greece. In the Forbidden City, the ancient Eastern civilization still remains mysterious and extensive. Join us in exploring how the two civilizations developed their distinctive features.